My top 10 reads of 2023 were easy to choose but hard to rank. And clearly I like long books because 7 out of 10 are over 500 pages. So without further ado, number 10, Away With Their Penguins with Hazel Pryor. This is a cosy story about an old lady named Veronica who doesn't have any friends or family and she's contemplating where, where, who she'll leave her money to when she dies. And she watches a lot of nature documentaries and she sees one about these penguins in Antarctica and it talks about uh, how in they're endangered and this conservation program. And so she just decides then and there to go to Antarctica and stay with the scientists there and just observe the penguins and see if she will want to donate all her money to them. Meanwhile, uh, back home in England, this guy named Patrick discovers that he's her grandson, her long lost grandson that she didn't know she had. And so throughout the story, they communicate with each other. And at first, Veronica doesn't really like him. Um, she, she, she finds him, you know, uncultured, lazy, but eventually they grow to bond and he also joins her in Antarctica. And so this is a very cute and cosy story, a very feel good story. And we see how the two of them kind of grow, not just bond, but also grow as individuals throughout the story. Number nine. New York 2140 by Kim Stanley Robinson. This is a speculative fiction book set in 2140 in New York, as you might have guessed. And it follows a number of people in this setting where due to climate change, the sea levels have risen, the city has basically become kind of like Venice to navigate. You have these buildings and you have to go by a boat to get anywhere. The streets are flooded and what I like about this book is that it basically feels like a diorama of the setting. Um, it definitely has a plot and one of the things that holds it back from being further on the list is that there are definitely things about it that were kind of confusing. There was all this like financial big corporate stock sort of stuff that I didn't quite get it kind of went a bit over my head but I liked how this, it just felt like I was stepping into a diorama of the setting and just observing it. And I just really liked that. Um, it, it definitely has a plot, but I don't really remember much of the overall plot. My favourite characters to follow were these two homeless boys who kind of lived out of a boat and just kind of scavenged and hung out with the people in this one like apartment building. And they kind of got into a bunch of trouble, but one time they discovered that there might be a bunch of treasure um, buried, um, sunken down in the city. So they go and get some people to help them bring it up. And that, th those kids were my favourite characters, but they're not the only characters in the book. So number eight, The Fairy Man by Justin Cronin. I absolutely love his Passage Trilogy, so that's why I picked this one up. Um, this is a separate book though from that. But this is set in a secluded island society uh, where things are seemingly ideal and people are theoretically immortal. When you get old enough, you are retired and you are sent away to be reset and then to be young again with no memories of your past life and then you go on to live another whole nother life. You get adopted by people, at, by a couple or a, however, and you live through a whole nother life. And so our protagonist, Proctor Bennett, is a ferryman, which is someone who escorts the retirees off to be retired and reset. And so this story, um, explores some mysterious things that happen to him, mysterious things he discovers, a girl who does not seem to exist according to all of their systems, and he discovers a greater truth about the world, 
and why it exists and who he is. So it's a sci-fi story, but also kind of soft sci-fi. There's definitely, obviously, some advanced technology, but it's not heavy on that. There are no, like, robots or aliens or AI or anything like that. Number seven, Desperation by Stephen King. So this is about a bunch of people who are driving through America in, like, the, the desert in America. They're in the middle of nowhere, and they all stumble upon this seemingly abandoned town named Desperation. But, and that, well, I say stumble upon, they're actually all brought in by this one policeman. And so they are brought into this town and a bunch of messed up evil things start happening. People become possessed, animals become possessed and start doing some really weird things. And so the people all have to decide what they're going to do. How can they get out of here? Is that even possible? Um, there's also this kid in the group who is almost kind of like a prophet. He kind of like, almost, he is the voice of God. And they have to put their trust in him. And his seeming like apparent knowledge about the place and what's going on. Um, yeah, I like the atmosphere of this book, um, and just wondering, will they get out? How will they get out? What sacrifices need to happen in order to make that possible? So, number six, by far the shortest one on this list. This one's not even 150 pages, I don't think. Eric by Terry Pratchett. This is book nine in his Discworld series. And this is one of the Rincewind books. So this is about a, a kid named Eric who has some lofty aspirations. And so he, it's, he tries to summon a demon. This is kind of a parody of Faust, which I have not read but would like to read. So he, he tries to summon a demon and instead gets Rincewind, who, if you're familiar with Discworld, Discworld you'll know is basically the world's most rubbish wizard. Not a demon at all, though Eric does not seem to realise that no matter how much Eric uh, Rince, uh, Rincewind tells him. And so we followed them up through as they journey through the world and get into a bunch of different situations, meet a bunch of people. There are even references to mythology in here, Aztec mythology, the Trojan War and Odysseus from Greek mythology, uh, the underworld slash hell, in different mythologies. It, this was just a really fun book to read and it's not very long either. Number five, <clears throat> another Stephen King book. This is Four Past Midnight by Stephen King. This is a collection of four novellas that all horror stories. Um, my favourite one was so The Langoliers, which is the first one about a bunch of people on a plane who wake up uh, on their plane and suddenly discover that everyone else on the plane has disappeared, just vanished into thin air, and so they have to figure out what happened, um, what's going on, have they checked, got, gone to a different world, or can they get back to where they came from? Um, and also there's this malevolent force that is they also feel the second book in second novel novella in here is Secret Window, Secret Garden, which is also great. Um, about an author who writes a book and then one and then one night gets confronted by this guy who randomly shows up at his house and claims that he's plagiarized his book. And so the author goes and investigates this guy named Shooter and he doesn't seem to exist. So that's very mysterious, you know, who is this guy? How did he find out about him? What does he, what does he want, what will happen? Because the author is pretty sure he didn't plagiarize this book. So how does he get out of that? The third novella is The Library Policeman, about a guy who borrows a book from the library and obviously get, and gets in a bit of trouble. 
uh, as a result. That one does contain a bit of a trigger warning. I do have to warn you. Um, and there's also sort of a demon librarian in it. Um, and the last one is the sun dog, which is about a boy who gets a Polaroid camera and it takes this weird photo of this mysterious, malevolent looking dog. And each photo he takes, the dog seems to be doing something, getting closer. And so he goes to investigate <clears throat> what's happening. Should he keep the camera, get rid of it, destroy it? So, yeah. Number four, Machines Like Me by Ian McEwan. This is a altered history set in like, Thatcher era Britain. Um, and in this altered history, we have the synthetic humans, the first batch of synth synthetic humans, essentially androids. And so our protagonist, Charlie, buys one named Adam. And so this kind of explores him you know, living with Adam. And there's this, this other girl named Miranda in this, his sort of complex who sort of moves in with him. And so... There's a bit of a love triangle between them, though this, this isn't a romance story. The romance is basically a medium to explore Adam's developing personhood and to what extent Charlie has any right to try and restrict what Adam can do, how he can interact with them. Uh, and we also discover that Miranda has a bit of a secret of something she did long ago. And so we also explore the various perspectives of whether that was wrong or right. And I, I like this for the exploration of the history um, how, and the philo philosophical implications that it explores. We also see Alan Turing in this. He kind of lived longer than he did in reality. And he had a part to play in the development of the synthetic humans or robots, or androids rather. So that's, that's always fun. And when we see historical people in this kind of, this kind of stories, that's always interesting to me. So yeah, I like the philosophical nature of this book. I like how deep it is. I like the ways in which the characters used to explore these ideas. Number three, <clears throat> Master of the Game by Sidney Sheldon. This one I read last month. It was in my November wrap up. Um, basically, we follow this family this, that came into wealth at the start of the 20th century. And we follow multiple generations of the family as the matriarch, Kate, um, does what she can to ensure that there will be heirs to hold that wealth for, forever, presumably, and how she manipulates things to her benefit including her own family and how they're trying the sort of situations that they come into that she may or may not have had a hand in. And so this was very fun to read um, because most of the people in this book are very unlikable and sometimes you want to root for them and sometimes you don't, which is also fun. Most of them are unlikable, but they're still fun to read. And that's a rare thing in a book. So it's a fun book to read, like I said. Number two, Pillars of the Earth by Ken Follett. A thousand page epic about building a church, essentially. This one was also just really fun to read. We follow multiple characters. Tom, the builder, his stepson, Jack, who also ends up being a bit of a building prodigy. Uh, Prior Philip, who runs a monastery and um, also oversees this, this church that gets destroyed and needs to be rebuilt. And, and William Ham Hamley, this entitled, horrible person who is trying to do everything he can to thwart the building of the church along with the, the Bishop Willeran, who also has his own uh, agenda. And he's working with William, although he hates him. Um, and though 
one criticism which I think is valid is that it does feel a little bit repetitive in that they're building the church and then something goes wrong to just put, grind the process to a halt and so they have to figure out how to fix it, how to get around it or stop it, stop that problem. But that's also just really fun. I like seeing how Philip and Tom and Jack worked their way around that problem um, when the odds were against them. I, it was cathartic to see them overcome all of those problems. And also, William is kind of cartoonishly evil. But again, that's not necessarily bad. I mean, he's, he's the guy you love to hate, right? Um, another thing I really like about this book is that even though the protagonists all want to see this church built, a lot of the times they're all in conflict with each other. They all ha they have issues with each other. So that even though they're on the same team, they've all got their own separate kind of agendas and things they want to do or problems that they have to deal with that sometimes the other good guys cause. So the characters in here are really enjoyable. The one, one thing I must say is this one also comes with a bit of a mace trigger warning. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the first book in Ken Follett's Kingsbridge series. I really enjoyed it. I would not expect a thousand page book about building, building a church to be fun or epic or thrilling, but this is. I also really liked the details and the explanations when they're discussing the process of building the church and designing it and why you have to design certain things the way they are, um, why certain things have to be made of certain materials, or the shapes that are used in the construction. That's interesting. And number one, the best book that I read this year was Babel by R.F. Kuang. Uh, my sister bought me this for my birthday, actually. So, uh, thank you, sister. I loved it. Um, so, this book is set in early 19th century Victorian England, um, specifically uh, Oxford University. And it's kind of a magical book. We've, we have the system of words being use and more, not just words but translations of words in different languages being used to make things happen um being used in buildings or in life to make you and you can even to make buildings stronger or waterproof or to give people a certain impression when they walk into the room or all sorts of different things and so we follow this boy named Robin who has been taken from China to be a part of this program of um, the uh, Translators Institute of Translation studying the process of building these um, new pairs of words to create new essentially spells, charms, whatever you want to call them. And so it also explores um, the idea, like ideas of like racism and imperialism and colonialism and privilege and all that sort of thing, because uh, the British Empire is benefiting from peoples that they've colonised, but those peoples don't get to enjoy the benefit of their this silver magic that they're developing. Um, so yeah, we follow Robin, who at first loves this new life and tries to ignore any kind of cracks that seem to show in this perfect ideal world, but eventually he can't avoid them, especially with his fellow translators who are all also coming from these sort of different backgrounds. Um, yeah. So thank you for watching my top 10 books read this year. Like I said at the start, they were easy to choose. It was easy to choose the 10 books, but honestly, it was really difficult to rank them. Um, if you enjoyed the video, please like and subscribe. 
if you've read any of these books, please tell me in the comments what you thought of them. Did you enjoy them? Did you find them meaningful in ways that I found them meaningful? Go ahead and tell me what you thought. Thank you for watching and do lots of maths, read lots of books and you'll have a great day.